uh, we only knew of three subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, electrons. Now we know there are over 200 and counting. Muons, gluons, Klingons, <laughs> red, white, and green, and all of these elements exist, none of them exist, I'll say it another way, in isolation. They all exist in community. Their preferred, preferred pattern of hanging out is in threes. I find that intriguing. Be just like God to press the imprimatur of his person all the way into the subatomic. And as these uh, subatomic particles generate energy around each other in these communities, these families, they, are, they have frequencies. Literally, the universe all the way into the subatomic is singing praise. It is one massive song of praise. And I appreciate being uh, reminded of that tonight with, with the worship. But now that we got that out of the way, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I mean... Uh, the world has ended about four times, and um, each time it ends, it's typically a bunch of um, religious people sitting around waiting on God to show up. The last big ending, really, kind of, uh, in my lifetime, really, was Y2K, and I think Jesus missed his greatest chance to come back. <laughs> we had the table set for him, everybody was out looking. Now, it was funny, because Christians were, you know, waiting on the world to end. The rest of the world was out partying. And, um, but each world ending actually kind of corresponds to an information revolution, creation of writing, creation of the book. Changes everything. Um, I mean, can you imagine? You, we never would have had the modern education system or any of that if we were still operating off scrolls. Can you imagine? It's about two-thirds of the way through the scroll. How long would it take us all to get there, you know, to the same place? But finally someone figured out we can cut that sucker down the side and, and glue it and, and number it. It's on page 63. Boom. Changes everything. How we communicate. And, of course, now we have the digital world. The end of the world. Everything changes. And every time there's an information revolution, the world ends. And the world has to figure out a new world. Changes everything. You see, the last big deal, and by the way, the church has been through these. I mean, Jesus came in the scroll era, of course, changed everything. 500 years later, you've got Augustine there in the North, uh, North Africa looking literally at the end of the world. The Huns weren't just in the gate, at the gates. They were inside ransacking the joint. Rome's fallen. But out of that cultural clash and milieu, we get De Trinitate. We get City of God. We get Augustine's writings that literally shaped the theological discussion for a thousand years. Luther was an Augustinian monk. Fast forward a thousand years, now it's not the Holy Roman Empire that's collapsing, or the Roman Empire, it's the Holy Roman Empire that's collapsing. You have, at the same time, the rise of the book, uh, roughly to disseminate information, the rise of the nation state, the collapse of the middle. German princes huddle around Luther. They protect him. The Reformation's on, which is the religious counterpart to the Renaissance. And the church has to figure out a new way of being. So we get the reformers, Luther, Calvin. Fast forward 500 years, and here we are in another one of those times where we know less about what's coming than we know uh, at and, and, and any uh, of our time. And, but we know more about what is not going to make it. It's just we haven't ponied up the truth yet about it. Because the church is going to have to figure out a new way. The church is going to make it. We're going to make it. But we're going to have to figure out a new way of being in this new world that is literally emerging every minute in front of us. And what terrifies me is that those of us charged with leadership of the church can lag so far behind God in this because God is not caught off guard by this change. 
God is fomenting the change. If you don't believe that, you don't understand him as king. This is his world. I mean, this is his kingdom. He's the one that ushers in a postmodern world. The digital revolution does not have him scurrying back to school. He's way ahead of us, waiting on us to catch up to what he's up to. So I want to try to peer ahead a bit tonight. It really won't even be looking ahead. I'm trying to describe what's going on right now. It'll just seem like the future to some. Not you. I'm practicing for that group I've got to talk to next week. (laughs) Thanks for listening in. See, the, the... The truth is, we're going to have to change our narrative because our narrative no longer works. And we have been living out the narrative of the Reformation. It was exactly right for its time. But for 500 years, we've been trying to fix the church, and it's time to get over it. It's time to give up on that obsession. It's time to move in and align ourselves with what God is mostly up to in the world today, and it is not the church. You see, we we have, as a part of our Reformation stepping into that, we have become so church-centric in our thinking because the Reformation was designed to fix the church, to get it right. And what has happened is that that pounding of that drum over, over centuries... We've become more and more obsessed with ecclesiology. Everything has been shrink wrapped down to church. It's as if we believe that the church is God's primary concern on planet Earth. It's almost like we think the church is the fourth member of the Trinity. It's almost like we think the church is the point of it all. And the truth is, gang, that ain't so. Now, it makes church leaders nervous when I talk like this. I don't know why. Just because we've given our lives to... I'll I'll give you some examples of what happens when you you shrink wrap stuff down in the church. For instance, we've taken all of the discussion of gifts and stuff, we've tied it to the church. All of our file systems are ecclesiastical. They're driven by ecclesiology. For 500 years, we've been trying to figure out who gets to do what, when, under whose authority. You know, can they wear pants or do they, or skirt, or can they do it out with a, uh, somebody? And, and, and we've been figuring out what makes us different from each other with the result of thousands of tribes now focused on what we're not alike. Like Jesus' prayer in the garden was that we would be many. Apparently. All of us more right than each other, than the others. Thank God we're not like them. And it's, uh, and, and, and it's time for that narrative to yield to, the more, to a more biblical, more cosmic, more kingdom-oriented. And Brad introduced us this afternoon a bigger story than the little storyline we're playing out. We're playing too small a story. We have taken our scorecard, we've hooked it to how many people we can get to interrupt their lives, come sit in a place at a given time, and go through religious activity, and that's how we think the church is doing, and that's how we think the kingdom of God is getting along on this planet. And i got to tell you, it's not accurate read because God is not going to be pigeonholed like that he is not that weak he is not dependent on us he is um, the kingdom of God is doing fine when I told a bunch of Baptist pastors that recently they looked at me like I had a one eye in the middle of my head I said you guys relax because they're all guys of course Because that's the only biblical appropriate. (laughs) Thought I'd mess with you. See how different we are. You know, our tribe 
a few years ago now, maybe like 15, you know, decided that God couldn't use women as pastors. And this is going to be true, not just for us, but for everybody who really loved Jesus. And we published it the week after that. Not just our mind in our own business, but mind in everybody's business. The week after that, I was speaking to the Holston Conference of the United Methodist Church. 400 pastors in Lake Junaluska, North Carolina, beautiful setting. 300 of them were women. And I'm coming in as a Southern Baptist, and they are ready to kill something. <laughs> and I'm the likely target. They have beat their plowshares into swords. <laughs> so I go in and I say, it's great to be with the Holston Conference. I just weren't expecting so many pastor's wives to be here. <laughs> Boy, all the air went out of that room. They looked at me like, you idiot. Cannot believe, you know. And then I told them our younger daughter was named Susanna after Susanna Wesley. It seemed to fit for the moment. <laughs> Actually, it's true. But, I mean, look, look at how... Look, look. Our agenda is too small. Even the Pentecostal movement, which is kind of like the last gasp of trying to get the church figured out somehow, a hundred years later, we're out of gas. I mean, I could mess around, but I'm only, I've only got tonight and tomorrow morning. I don't have much time left. I guess I've got to go straight for this. And besides, there's a baseball game. At 9.37. I've been told that by six people. <laughs> I understand. I understand. I truly do. You're, you're, you're going to have even transition time uh, to get there. And so I've got to go for the juggler. I've got to go pretty quick. In fact, I was, I was with a Lutheran congregation on Reformation Sunday. Please don't hear things. Please don't hear stuff I'm not saying. The Reformation... Oh, it was, was, was a gift and an alignment, but we're done with that. I don't care what you say. We are done with that. <laughs> this pushback is unbelievable. I, anybody else hearing that? Uh, I, <laughs> and I was with the Lutheran Church on Reformation Sunday last year. It was in Kansas City, by the way, speaking of the enemy. And, uh, you know, I don't know why Lutherans think they own Reformation Sunday. And uh, so they, the, all the, the banners are waving and the kids' choirs are singing, the bells are ringing. I said, and this came by in time to preach. I said, well, you Lutherans have been working on fixing the church for 500 years. How's that working for you? <laughs> kind of got quiet. But I'd already been paid. <laughs> you, know, I'd already, you know, so I, was, I could tell the truth and... In fact, I'd already been by the bank just to make sure they couldn't get So, <laughs> most church leaders think that God is focusing all his attention on making sure the church is going to be okay. Can I just tell you something? Church is not at risk, the kingdom is not at risk. The only issue is whether or not in our lives we're going to align with the big mission of God. That's the only thing at risk. You, me, whether or not we're going to pursue God's mission or an idolatrous at worst or at least misguided at best, even though well-meaning, alternative mission. See, I think the kingdom is the story. Brad talked about it this afternoon. I totally agree. The kingdom is the big story. It's what God is up to. It's what God has always been up to. If you can say always with some kind of time. And it is what God will always be because, you know, we start the Bible. I'm going to have to do a little deconstruction here just to show you the difference. We start the Bible in a garden with no church. We end the Bible in a city with no church. 
It's made very plain. There's no need for a tabernacle, for a temple, because God is... The church is not forever. The church has a function in, in time. It is a creation. Genesis 12, God creates a people... And we have a function, and we have stepped into that meta-narrative. It's a continuous narrative that has multiple chapters. We have stepped into this meta-narrative of that new covenant that Jesus says, but guess what? The kingdoms, including the church of this world, are going to be folded into the kingdom. The kingdom is forever. We are not taught to pray, thy church come. And Jesus did not say, I've come to give you church and give it to you more abundantly. The kingdom is the point. Now, you have a right to know what I think, what I mean when I talk about the kingdom. Quite honestly, growing up in my tribe, I heard very little about it. We sang the round, seek ye first the kingdom of God. You know, did it in harmony, stuff to make it interesting, keep us busy for a while as kids. But we didn't know what it was about. A little later on, it seemed like the kingdom, I somehow I picked up, that it was just kind of church on steroids. You know, when you double down with church stuff, do it a lot, like a revival service over and over and over again. Then later on, it became something like when two churches cooperated, and especially if it was the Methodist youth group and the Baptist youth group across denominational lines, that was the kingdom with a Friday night football fellowship after the game. And then about the time I got into college and on into seminary, then the moral majority, uh, moral majority down in my, our part of the world rose up, and I, I learned the kingdom was about confronting the world with its sin and getting the right president and Supreme Court. You know, all those things that the early believers had on their side so that they could prosecute the Christian mission. So it was about fixing the culture. And then I went to seminary, And I learned the kingdom is the rule and the reign of God. And that settled it. Are you kidding? I couldn't wrap my brain around that. The rule and the reign of God sounds like everything to me. If it sounds like everything, it means nothing. So I couldn't, I couldn't. So I've really been struggling in my life as as I've come into a great awareness that the kingdom is the, what is the kingdom? So I think the kingdom is life as God intends. I'm trying to take the discussion out of earthly kingdom context because Jesus said my kingdom's not of this world. And to try to retrofit or force fit God's kingdom into our concepts of kingdom seems to me not not a smart deal, especially when we're told it's not like that. So I kind of go to what's the point of it all. And it seems to me the point of the kingdom is life. Just think with me a minute. Life is the one gift that none of, none of us asked for it. We all just woke up screaming or crawling through birth canals. And we've been, I was talking to a crew earlier today about this. And we've been given this gift and it's taken us all of our life to figure it out. It's this gift that we have to fool around with. We didn't ask, but we are given it as a puzzle and in some sense to solve and to celebrate, we start the Bible with a garden with a tree of life in the middle of the garden. That's not accidental. That story of saying what God is up to. In fact, when Eden disintegrates, God sends an angel to stand guard over that tree. See, because he is not going to let life be snuffed out because it's his gift, because he's the source of of all life. He is life. It's spilled out. Anywhere you find life, you have run into God. Anywhere you find life, you have run into God. And so, when, when that, that fast forward into the book, a city with a river of life flowing through it, Lined on either side, trees of life. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. I've come to give you life. and give it. it seems to me this is a recurring theme. The point is life. Good news about this for those of us who are trying to figure out ways to connect with people and introduce them to God. There ain't nobody on the planet uninterested in life. 
Everybody's got one, and they're trying to figure out what to do with it. And it's a quality of life. It's life as God intends. In fact, when that question is posed by the religious leader, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Only Westerners have turned that into a thought of some kind of time. that We end this life, and then we pick up with eternal life. The Jewish concept, Hebrew concept of life, and they all got this listening on that day. He was talking about a quality of life here and now. This is why Jesus said people are already on the road to destruction. They don't get out there. They come to a T intersection and go left or right. Make a decision out there. People are already on the way to heaven. They're already on the road to hell. Ours is a rescue mission to try to off-ramp some people who are already on the road to destruction. People are already there. And, and so the quality of life that people have, you know, and when he teaches us to pray for the kingdom to come, how does he say it? Eventually, no. Your kingdom come on earth right now as it is in heaven. The kingdom is all about life, every spectrum of life. It cannot be whittled down to one aspect of human existence, just spirituality, it encompasses the entire bandwidth of human existence. And so, you know, our relationships with each other, with ourselves, with God, with the planet, with, with, you know, with all the stuff that is involved in that, every aspect, everything that sin marred then, everything that diminishes life is sin, and God is restoring it. Now, the kingdom saga is the extent that God will go to to make sure we have access to this life. Even when the tables look turned, even when it looks like ninth inning, base, you know, nobody on, three three balls, two strikes, or 0-2, I guess. Whatever. God is providing. See, Jesus comes to show us what life is. Not just teach us about life, but to live the life God intended you to live, me to live. This is what life looks like. He wraps himself, not just in light, as we sang, but in flesh. And he says, I want to show you the life I had in mind. It's remarkable. This is so stunning. This is such a huge story. And the problem comes when we chip away at it. And say, but what God is really focused on is not making this life available and improving the lives of all people on the planet, but what God is really focused on is getting a few people on board and making sure that they're doing their religious duty in appropriate ways. It's too small a story. Now, don't. I know my tribe right now would be thinking, is this universalism? You're telling who's in, who's out? I haven't got there yet. Don't worry about that. I think people need Jesus, and I'm hearing my wife right now say things in my head. Tell them you love Jesus. Tell them you read the Bible. <laughs> Tell them you believe people need Jesus. I do. But we've got to figure out ways of introducing people to Jesus and waiting on them, setting up church shop and waiting on them to come to us to get it ain't getting it done. Everybody in this room knows that. Which means we're going to have to imagine ourselves in a new way. We're going to have to be church differently. This stuff about doing church better, forget it. It's not going to matter. I speak in these big old honking six flags over Jesus places all the time. I mean, I'm protecting my retinas from laser light shows before I speak. We've even got smoke so we know when the spirit comes in now. (laughs) It's color-coded with the liturgical year in case the spirit's forgotten what time of year it is. Although it always hurts my feelings because the band gets the smoke. I stand up to speak and they cut the smoke off. A clear sign. Reggie has come. Now the spirit has departed. (laughs) That only belongs to the praise and worship. 
And so our idea was if we got the church fixed, it would take care of a, uh-uh. We're going to have to figure out a way to be church where people already are. And that's going to, fo- that's going to force us to a culture shift that is bigger than anything we've been up against. What I'm talking about here ain't the fall program. It is a radically different way of seeing ourselves. You see, when I... I, Well, I should start a sentence so I could finish one. I've got about six open in my brain and it's just all frozen. (laughs) I don't know why I'm feeling such pressure. I I took a nap. I think I'm too rested. I think that what what we've got to do to shift the culture, I'll I'll, I'll just tell you the big buckets. If you're going to change a culture, you've got to change what you talk about and how you talk about it. This is why I talk about we've got to talk about something different besides the church. It no longer has traction with people in our culture. They don't care about your church. They don't care about your church's vision. They don't want to hear about how your church is is whatever, better than everybody else's. They just don't care. And they don't care if you have contemporary worship and if you finally got a sexy sax player and, and, and found decent coffee to improve. All this stuff just doesn't matter anymore. We got to get off this stuff. And, I mean, it's like opium to people. We just think, oh, so, so I'm going to give, I'm already giving you language lessons of stuff that we're going to have. We're going to have to talk about the kingdom of God more and what that means. Because, by the way, we have good, we have a, a, a good example to follow. Jesus came announcing What? The kingdom of God. 90 plus times, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. You know how many times Jesus mentioned church? And it's redundant. Only the establishment clause, and I'm going to get to that. Wouldn't you think if Jesus, he, he did not, he does not announce the gospel of the church. He doesn't announce the gospel of the gospel. I'm, I'm telling you, my tribe's all hung up on getting people to sign off on propositional statements that even the devil can agree to. <laughs> the devil knows propositionally that God is through, Jesus died for the sins of the world, Bible's authority, he can sign off on all that stuff. We've got to go for something much bigger than just getting people to assent to something. Oh my gosh. So what we talk about, if you're going to change culture, and I'm going to talk to you then, I already have, about kingdom, and I'm going to talk to you where, how the church relates to this in just a minute, if I get to stay. Then the second thing you have to do to shift a culture is you have to change the scorecard. In the morning, I'm going to talk to you about what the scorecard might, just some possible implications. Because let's just, let's just, I'll just set it out. If in fact... The kingdom is about life as God intends. Do we have the courage to hook our scorecard to whether or not our communities are doing any better? Who do we think we are to decide that if we've got three more this year than the same Sunday last year, or if we met budget a week earlier, or we were able to fund our whatever, that somehow God is more happy with so, do we really believe that on Monday morning God is waiting on church attendance numbers? Hurry up with those numbers, Gabe. Uh, you know, <laughs> to decide how the kingdom of God is working on planet Earth. Are we really that church blind? You would think so, given every denomination scorecard. Every denomination, thank God you're not a denomination. Your movement. <laughs> How many showed up? How much money did they bring? How often are we? Uh, 
Look at all this church. We measure church activity. Participated in by church people. Led by church people. We've raised consumers, not disciples. And so, and, and then we've, 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 not you, I'm, again, it's Presbyterians. They're the worst at this. Because they think they're the elect. And I might write a book with a subtitle of why the elect probably won't make it or something like that. But in fact, I've got about a hundred titles. I think I'm just going to write a book of titles and let somebody else do the hard work. Um, so tomorrow morning, oh, it's, it would take great courage if I were to finish this thought. For us actually to think if we are being true representatives of the kingdom of God, life in our villages, our towns would be better. But that would require real courage, wouldn't it? We'd actually have to be concerned about life. We'd have to actually believe that God cared about these people. And that he woke up on Sunday morning not just concerned about, just, not just to show up on our platform. And then the third thing, and I'll get to this tomorrow, right before I jump out that door and run to catch a plane. There's got to be a leadership shift. And I'll finish our time tomorrow sharing with you what I think some of the things we've got to do if we want to realign the church with the real mission of God on planet Earth, which is his kingdom. Now, what is the church, then, you're saying? So what role does the church play in this? Well, this is part of the language. I've already, you know, talked about what kingdom means, and, and maybe get, you don't have to agree with it, but I'm talking about it more. I find that people tend to resonate with that. So what, what do I mean, then, when I talk about church? Well, gang, I, for me, the church, here's what I think about it. It's the people of God... Partnering, this would be nice to use a PowerPoint at this point, wouldn't it? Partnering with him in his redemptive mission. I'm trying to get it out there. Y'all just calm down. His redemptive mission in the world. And every one of these phrases is critical. Y'all got it. Um, it's, I'm going to tattoo it on the back of your eyelid. So, all right, so people of God partnering with him in his redemptive Now, that sounds pretty innocuous, but think about this. See, when I talk about us imagining church differently for this world, that we're, if, the, if, if the kingdom is about life and where people already are, wouldn't it be just like God to have anticipated that and so he would have the church not be a thing? But see, I didn't grow up. Church, if I grew up not understanding church as the people of God. Here's the church, here's the steeple. Open. We didn't get to the people till we got past the church in the steeple. See, because church was a thing. Church in the Western world has become an it. First century believers would have no understanding of what we talk about when we talk about going to church as if it's a destination on the corner of 3rd and Main. They didn't think of church that way. Guess why? Because it wasn't supposed to be that way. Church is not a, 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 a what, it's a who. It's whoville. It's, it's a relationship. You know, it's, it's the best way I talk about it to help people understand this, because a lot of people in our congregations, not yours, I'm just thinking about others, when you talk about relationship with Jesus and all that, just, they have a relationship with an organization. They have a membership in a club of people that think like them and look like them and sing like them and get their language and all that kind of stuff. But this relationship with Jesus is just going, ah, yeah, we know about it. The best way I know to say is, is everywhere I am in the world, no matter what time zone, what continent, 24-7, I'm Kathy McNeil's husband. There is never a time I'm not Kathy's husband. 
Even if she doesn't come up in the conversation, she informs the conversation. I tell you, I've already told you, she's been talking to me most of the time. Yeah. I can't tell you everything she said. <laughs> Have a little self-respect left. But the truth is, you can't know me very well without, you can only know me so far without knowing Kathy. After 35 years, so much of who I am is wrapped up in that relationship. Just like someone who doesn't know Jesus can't know you all that well because he's central to who you are. They can know you to a point, but see, there's something that she and I share that's a, a space that only the two of us share. And we are ourselves in that. And so when I talk to people about church, I'm trying to help them understand it's kind of like that. 24-7, no matter where we are, we are always church. Church is a way of being. It's not a thing we do. It's not a part of our lives. That would be like saying my marriage is kind of part of my life. I just kind of take a day a week and give a little attention to it, go through some activities. Are you serious? Who would think, who would think that's a marriage? It is central to who I am. So I husband my way through life, just like we church our way through life. It's a verb. It's a way of being. So we church at church, but we church at home. We church in the neighborhood. We church, in other words, missional followers of Jesus understand that life is a mission trip. We don't go on mission trips anymore. Life is a mission trip. The whole darn thing, from stem to stern, it's not an activity, it's a way of being. Now, it, unless we start talking about church, which means that our language is going to have to undergo radical, even when we talk, I'm, I'll just throw a few things out there, and you probably won't do this, but I'm just messing with you. Even when we talk about our churches, that's not biblical. There aren't churches. There is one church. But... In our little Western mind, that's why we have all these church, 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 church. Because that's an organizational it. A, a what, a what, a what, a what, a what. Corner, third, and main. Something we're supposed to. Or we view the church as a vendor of religious goods and services. Somewhere we go to get our, our sermon pairs, or our youth ministry pairs, or our women's pairs, or ministry pairs, or our, you know, whatever. Because we think of church as a set of activities. And then you say, are you going to go to church? Don't miss church. A first century believer would have no idea. Those folks in India, when I was with them, they have no idea what we're talking about. Don't miss church. I am church. I'm not all the church. But everywhere I am, the church is. Just like everywhere I am, my marriage is, not all of it. And not even the best part of it. You would agree if you met Kathy. You'd throw me back, keep her, that's for sure. See, this is a different way of thinking. But if we don't get this, we're going to keep coming up with church program responses to dwindling numbers of people who want to spend time with us, take time out of their life to come to religious activity and scorecard that and say we're losing because they're not willing to accommodate that kind of rhythm. If I were the enemy... I would put you under that kind of stress. I would give you an assignment that is impossible to do and have you decide that that, that that is the scorecard for how you're doing it. What I'm trying to do is to set us free. Free to follow God in all of his work and learn how to, uh, to enjoy. All right, all right, all right. So the people of God. Now, by the way, there's a content to this. What is the Abrahamic uh, covenant? Abe, I'm going to bless you so that you can... Yeah. If I were at your church Sunday, and right, just like that, you should feel better because I won't be. I mean, there's a good cause for celebration just in the midst of all this. But if I were there, I would preach the one sermon I have. And I only need one anymore because I never get asked back. 
I would probably preach something like, why don't we practice being the people of God this week? Let's bless three people intentionally. Not some random act of kindness, rake and run, some silly something like, pay it forward at Tim Hortons, I'll buy your donut, don't tell them why, mystery shopper. The whole point is to create a conversation. The whole point is to create a moment that God can show up and show off. Because he loves to do that. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, and then I would say, and tell your stories next week. And I can tell you, I mean, you, you know this. Whether it's praying for a wait staff person, you know, at a restaurant or, or a neighbor that you know. I'm telling you, we, we have got to practice being people of blessing. That's not how the world perceives us. Probably you in Canada, but not where I live. The world does not view the church as people of blessing. We're people of judgment, people of hypocrisy, people who hate gays, people who are, you know, troglodytes and in, in a bunch of things. I mean, there is a whole, there's a whole list of stuff. We were given the job, though, to be people of blessing. That was our covenant. And then Jesus reintroduces the covenant. And all right, so, so, so there is a content to what it means to be people. And by the way, you can record, just to show you scorecard, you can record how many spiritual conversations your folks are having with people. You can let them pony up for that. Because I promise you this. Unless and until our number of spiritual conversations with people go up, our conversion rate is never going to go up. And the best way I know to start conversations and to, to, is, is to be people of blessing, people who are interesting, people who people want to talk to. This is why, I mean, I was in San Francisco recently. Hardly the buckle of the Bible belt, you know. Northern California, where they eat Christians as appetizers, my part of the country, kind of like your country. We're trailing. So I'm there, this pastor I'm with, this Italian restaurant, waitress that we get to know a little bit, banter and back and forth. And he asked her the question. In a minute, we're going to have our blessing for our meal. How can we ask God to bless you? Brilliant question. And she said, hang on, i got one other table. I'll be right back. Now, I've used that same question lots of times. I have never had a waitress throw a tray down, threaten to call the ACLU, have me thrown out, call management. You can't practice religion here like that. I have never, i tell you what I have had. I've had what happened in this case where she came and sat down and spilled out a bunch of stuff. Just simply because say, we want to pray for you. How can we pray for you? You say, well, Canadians are not going to do it. I'm reminding you this is Northern California that I'm talking about. A very secular world. She did say, what brought her back to the table? She said, my boyfriend, of course, she's been living with this guy, so we told her she was going to hell. <laughs> that was the pickup line that my tribe taught me, you know. You know, you're going to go to hell and fry like sausage. And then we wondered why people didn't want to know more about that and follow us home, you know? I mean, go figure. And, uh, and so we told her when she straightened up her life, God would deal with her. Because, you know, as people of blessing, it's our job to announce who gets the blessing. Because they're rationed. Only to people who behave like us. This is the world I grew up in. I'm telling you. In so many ways, this was the implication. Thank God we're not like that. It's our call to worship. And so, so she sat down and she said, My boyfriend lost his grandmother last week. He's real close to her. And um, he came in the bedroom last night. Been watching Joel Osteen. I'm just telling you, God's a big old God out there. (laughs) 
He, so he comes in the bedroom and he says, I need God in my life. So that's why she sat back down at our table. You have any ideas of what I can tell him? Of course, I was stumped because I'm a consultant. So I turned to the pastor. <laughs> it's your job, bro. You're the pro. He gave her a three-point sermon. No, we had a fantastic talk. The manager came by several times, didn't know who had who hostage. <laughs> Last thing I knew that, uh, you know, Gary followed up in the relationship and, and she's actually, and, and he got some people in touch with her that, uh, that have been continuing the conversation about her spiritual life. I don't always do this. And I know, because you're kind of, you know, a little more demure than Americans. I just to let you know, I don't, I don't go in, you know, looking for somebody, you know, trying to put a star on my belt or something, you know. In this case, I just said, I, I, if you'd like, I can pray for you right now, because she was really burdened. I rarely do that, because I'm not trying to make people uncomfortable. I'm just trying to start a conversation. Because, by the way, if you are a person of blessing, you actually believe God, not just believe in God. You actually believe that God is already at work in every person we meet. That we're not the ones that God is pursuing every person on this planet. He's already at work, and we just have to play our part. You see, I grew up. That if we, it doesn't matter how many conversations we have, all, if we didn't club it in the head, drag it to church, and throw it in a pew, it did not count. <laughs> That's a church centric score. But what if we were celebrating every week how many spiritual conversations as people of blessing we've had with our neighbors and the people around us, and we begin to tell those stories? How exciting would that make church? Instead of just an archaeological dig through a text, and I found some new bones this week uh, digging through Nehemiah. Uh, how about some stories about God showing up this week and showing off this week? I'm telling you, it changes. I was in Houston, and I gave this one. So, did I finish about I was going somewhere. I left something out in the town. Now, there's something I left. I've got to remember what it is. I've got to pick it up. I was in Houston recently, and I spoke. Before I got to the airport, people were already sending me stories. One woman on the way home from church wanted to get her assignment over with quick, I guess. Because she had three. And I tell people, not more than three. Don't, work, don't wear God out. Save room for next week. She called somebody. She thought, a, a church, but she dialed the wrong number and got somebody else. And... So they were going, oh, I'm sorry, going to hang on. She said, but wait a minute, uh, I, I have to be kind to three people this week, so I'd like to get one off my list. Uh, that's really not what she said. She said, wait a minute, um, before we hang up, since I just died, is there something, I, how can I ask God to pray? I'm just coming home from church. We talked about uh, God wanting to bless everybody. How can I ask God to bless you? Now, actually, this is fairly safe. It's a cell phone, you know, unless you think that it's been rerouted and, in some cray machine and Snowden's got it and there, Putin's listening. So, um, and so, uh, maybe, but I um, wish y'all wouldn't interrupt me like that. <laughs> and, um, and so this lady said, there was silence in a minute. She said, ma'am, yeah, I'm just, she said, you, I can't believe you asked that. I've lost my job. This is Houston, oil industry. It's taking people's life. She said, I've lost my job. My son's lost his job. He's moved in with us. He's sick. We need a doctor. We, we, we. And this lady said, well, I'll pray for you. And by the way, um, if you'll send, when I hang up, if you'll send me your email, I know some people. I, I can put you in touch with some people that are maybe looking for folks. She had five job offers that week that she was able to send this woman. And the woman, when she called her back, said, I don't guess there are any wrong numbers, huh? See, you got to believe God. Even the devil believes in God. That ain't no big shake. And so you you you're just what you just do your. I mean, I can remember JJ. I can remember JJ was a waiter at Longhorns. 
uh, where I used to eat a lot, out, out on the part of town where I live. He's different from me in every way. He's tall, he's skinny, he's got hair, he's got body art all over, body piercings. I would never get, JJ could never travel with me around. We'd have to ship his head separately. Uh, it would never get through TSA because of all the metal and stuff like that. And, um, and so, you know, um, and I, I remember when I asked TJ, how can I ask God? It scared him to death. He ran, hid in the kitchen. He didn't come back. I guess he thought I was Pentecostal or something. <laughs> I was going to bring out the snakes and the oil, and this, let's get her going. Uh, but so I didn't bring anything up to, uh, to Jay for, for six more months. I never mentioned a thing to him except when I would, you know, go in and say, Hey, JJ, man, it's good to see whose order have you screwed up, you know, whatever. Nice color. He changed hair. His hair changed colors every week. And uh, so he comes to my table on a Friday lunch. Kathy and I are eating there. She scooted to the restroom. He says, hey, Reggie, I just want to let you know I'm moving. I said, you are? Where are you going? Atlanta. Is this a good move for you? Yeah, I got friends there. I said, way to go, JJ. I'll ask God. I've not mentioned God for six months since the first time. Not a very good evangelist. I didn't have the weekly report from JJ. Nine touches or whatever you have to do to. And so, because JJ is just a project, he's not a real person. And so, he said, I said, I'll pray for you, JJ. I'll ask God to bless you. And then I slid down the pew to get some chemicals for my tea. And J.J. now, he's not church broken, okay? So he doesn't understand church speak. You know, when we tell each other, I'll pray for you, it means we're done now. I mean, you know. Um, I mean, I got to go. I got to go. Uh, we'll pray for you. Okay. It's just our, it's our exit line. All right, so, and so don't know, so I, I'll pray for you. And so J.J.'s standing there at the end of my table with his head bowed because I just told him that I was going to ask God to bless him. And he thought I meant it. <laughs> well, you're talking about being called. I said, what are you going to do? So I asked him to hold hands and kneel. <laughs> it's important that people work for the blessings. This is clear biblical theology, you know. And they've got to be uncomfortable or it doesn't count, you know. <laughs> I prayed for him. And I didn't get the pilgrims in and the four spiritual laws and start with the fountain. Of fire. Yeah, I, didn't get I just asked God to bless it. Now, at the end of the prayer, he didn't look up and say, oh, what doth prohibit me from being baptized? You know. <laughs> and, you know, and we race into the kitchen. I mean, all they had is a salad sink. It'd be kind of hard to get enough... Stay down, you know. I mean, I mean, I mean, it really wouldn't be much of a Baptist. And so, I got to tell you, I, I that was the end of the conversation. Now, two weeks later, I was in there, had to be his last night. He sat down at my table. I said, JJ, you know, I, I told him the whole story, told him the big kingdom saga, how God loves him, and you know, all that. All that he had never heard twenty. Two, three years old. Never heard it. Never been in church. No one's ever told him that. And he looked at me. He said, wow. So I'm going to think about that. I still don't have a conversion to report to you. But you know what? I'm completely relaxed about it. Because guess what? Just because J.J.'s moving off my screen don't mean he's moving off God's. And God's got somebody else in Atlanta ready to run the next leg of that race. Who, who do we think we serve? What kind of king is having to track people one at a time if it's up to us to get it done? Are you kidding? We serve the king, for crying out loud. He's way ahead of us. It's my job just to do my part, run my leg of the race. Boy, how... It is so freeing once we get that. We don't have to close the deal. 
Now, there are times I am the last person. And it's so exciting. Holy cow, that's fabulous. But I don't get to make that decision. I just have to be faithful. And people will tell me what leg of the race they're on if I just listen. They'll tell me. Jesus listened to people. He asked questions. He didn't power up on them just like he didn't power up on me. Imagine how freeing this could be if we just told stories of the spiritual conversations about God, people, life. It would feel a little bit like the first century. Like church when we got together. And by the way, this is a redemptive mission, meaning partnering with God. It's his mission, not ours. See, the church, and, 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 and it's being played out in the world, not in the church. For God so loved the church that he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the world. So I guess that means we're supposed to be having an impact in the world. Then why are we so worried about God coming and fixing our church? If I were the devil, I would sell us on that. To keep us busy. While the world goes to hell in a handbasket, we're busy. Very busy. Jesus is coming soon. Look busy. And this redemptive mission covers every aspect of life. See, the church was never designed to be the destination. An analogy I use to help people like this I'm just is like tomorrow when I leave here, I, you know, drive back to Gander, get on a plane, fly to Newark. This particular trip, I don't go through Atlanta till Tuesday to get back home. I first go to Dallas, you know, whatever. But every week, basically, I go through Atlanta, Hartsfield, Jackson International Airport. Busiest airport in the world. 260,000 people a day. And I have met most of them. <laughs> We've been in line somewhere. I'll tell you something. When Atlanta Airport gets the scorecard confused, when they think they're winning when all the planes, if they think they're winning when all the planes are on the ground, close to the hub and the concourse is full of people. Let me tell you what's really going on. It's screwing up a bunch of people's lives. A bunch of people are not happy. A bunch of people aren't getting where they want to go. A bunch of people are stuck at the airport. Now, I can tell you, I never wake up saying, boy, I can't wait to go to Atlanta, Hartsfield, Jackson. They've reopened Popeye's Chicken on Concourse C. I never think that. But I do wake up saying, boy, I can't wait to get to Newfoundland and persecute some Pentecostal pastors. <laughs> so it's worth the trip to go through. You see, the airport is so important, I can't do my life mission without it. It doesn't demean the airport to put it in its proper place in fact the problem is when it steps out of its proper role and assumes another identity that's when things get messed up you know where I'm going with this the kingdom's the destination not the church we have a very vital role in fact it's so critical that, that we fulfill this role, that when we get misaligned, like I think we have the prospect of being, in my case, then we're messing up people's lives. We want to get the, no airport can hold a candle to the destination. No one comes back from airport from trips with books to put on their coffee at great airports of the world. You just got to go there. We spent three days waiting on our luggage. It was fabulous. You, we're going to get up another trip to go next year. Are you kidding? It's kind of what I was saying this morning about catch and release. 
The only way you keep something alive that you catch is release it back. When we say, now you've arrived, that live well is only going to be fun for so long. And then it's going to feel like things are closing in. All right. So tomorrow, I want to say, well, if we, because uh, I've got two more things to say tonight, by the way, and you're going to make your game. I see this. People have already got the earbuds in there listening to pregame stuff, dialing it up. Some, um, tomorrow, I want to talk about what happens when the church does reflect the kingdom. But these are, but, and which reminds me of one of the two things I want to end with tonight. Let's go back to when Jesus established the church, our role. Over there in Matthew, what is it, 16? Somewhere over there in there. Who do people say I am? Y'all seen the movie at least, right? <laughs> Pete speaks up, you're the Christ, son of the living God. Way to go, Pete. Right answer. A on the exam. Tell you what, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. I'm going to, on that statement, I'm going to build my church, and I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. I'm going to tell you what, I've heard all my life that phrase, keys of the kingdom, and what I thought was the church owned the kingdom. See, I grew up thinking about the kingdom through church lenses. What I'm arguing for is that we think about the church through kingdom lenses. I grew up seeing the kingdom as a subset of church activity. The church is a subset of kingdom activity. I grew up thinking that the church got to lock and unlock because of that phrase. Like we bring out the fine dishes at special occasions. Because we're the ones that are the cupboard keepers or whatever. You know what that word key meant? When a rabbi, now by the way, this is not explaining scripture because everybody that heard it knew. They didn't have to explain it to them. Jesus is talking to his rabbinic group. He's a rabbi. When a rabbi felt like a student got their teaching, reached the level of whatever, the rabbi gave the student a key. It was the rabbi's insignia. You run into a rabbi, a, a student, of Hillel, he had the Hillel insignia. Shammai, he had the Shammai. They were the rabbinic schools. You knew by their key what they thought. You knew by their key, their, their attitude about all things spiritual and all things life. You knew by their key that they had graduated. Remember, Jesus had asked the exam question. Who do people say? Pete got the answer right. It's graduation time. Here's my insignia. The key to the kingdom. Which means that when people brush up against a disciple of Jesus, they're supposed to come away with kingdom. They're supposed to be pointed to life. Not shrink wrapped into some kind of religious conversation about stuff. They're supposed to be pointed to an abundant life that God intends for them. That's supposed to be true when they brush up against you personally and when they brush up against our corporate expression of church. They're supposed to come away knowing those people. Those people are all about life. And wanting people to have a better life. And how interested do you think people would be in that? I suggest it's the biggest story going on the planet. And it's time we got in on it. Let's lay down our smaller dreams and dream big. Let the king expand your eyes and your vision for what he's up to already. And join him in his mission, not yours. 
and watch him show off. Show up and show off in your town. Not just in your church. I think everybody in this room would, would sign up for that. And it would be just like God to let it happen.